Okay, I may as well get started. I'm Peter, uh, my three audience members. Welcome, thank you for coming. I'm sure more people will stream in. Uh, this is, I, I'm an economist by background, and so this is gonna be a talk from like an economics perspective, thinking about the way decentralized exchanges work and how we can make them more successful. And I'm gonna propose, you know, that the decentralized exchanges aren't slow enough. You know, they're famous for being slow, unresponsive, uh, and having poor throughput, high latency, and the proposal is to improve them by making latency even longer, by, by adding some latency that's, that's not added indiscriminately, but in a particular way uh, which I expect, or there's a, a theoretical basis for expecting, will make uh, pr the prices available more favorable uh, for retail investors. And this, this is called uh, selective delay. It is also known as last look. I'm not going to mention this, but if you're familiar with the foreign exchange market, uh, there's a a trading rule called last look, which is this, basically the same as selective delay. If you, you might, has anyone heard of last look? A selective delay? No, okay. Okay, but hopefully I'm gonna expect that you are familiar with um, the basic way that a, a, a continuous limit order book works. Um, the idea that we have these offers to buy and sell that uh, someone called the maker makes and then some taker arrives and can, can uh, make requests to fill those offers. Does everyone, does that make, is maker, taker, is that familiar to everyone? Okay, good. Okay, so what's the motivation for this? The motivation is to deal with this problem of low usage of decentralized exchange protocols. So we have this huge numbers of developers that are active on Ethereum. We have huge numbers of developers that are active in the DeFi space. But the actual sort of usage volumes of decentralized exchanges are a little bit disappointing, right? And so most projects are sort of struggling with how do we onboard more users? How do we grow? And how do we get that uh, parabolic growth curve going? And in order to convince more users, we have to think about where they might come from. Well, one possibility is the existing traders on DEXs will trade more intensively. They'll do 10 times as much volume per trader, but this isn't really realistic. There simply aren't that many users, any individual identities trading that we could expect a lot of growth to materialize from that you know, more intensive usage. Another possibility is that you know, new people will discover the blockchain, they'll discover Ethereum, and that will certainly happen, but it would be a long, you know, gradual process. It might take five years or 10 years. And so the sort of near-term um, basket of users that might be captured and brought to trade on our decentralized exchanges are the users that are currently using centralized exchanges. And how do we get them? Well, we must find some way of giving them what they want. Right? We must have some compelling reason for them to switch allegiance and begin to trade on DEXs rather than centralized exchanges. They must be given a, a better value proposition of some, some sort. So how can we create value for these users? What can we do that would make them make this switch? And what type of, of user should we target? And you know, we hear you might hear a lot at this conference and elsewhere about high frequency traders or algo traders and how the centralized exchange ecosystem isn't really usable from their perspective. It's too slow. Um, there's low throughput. You know, they may trade 10 times a second. We can handle one transaction per second. That won't work. And so um, I'm going to argue that this, is, this isn't really necessary. Targeting these groups is not really essential. And instead, the retail investor, the person who, you know, they, they hear about crypto or they hear about some new token and they want to they want to put five thousand dollars and hodl that five thousand dollars you know for several months in some token they've heard about or they they, they need to liquidate that because it went up in value or, or they've they realized they they have uh, bills to pay someone got sick and these people who are doing these kind of standard mom and pop trades i would argue are, are the group that need to be targeted their activity on centralized exchanges uh, needs to move over to decentralized exchanges and we need some means to convince them to do that Okay, so the reason for this contention that retail investors drive adoption is that the other layers of the ecosystem, the other types of groups such as HFTs and algo traders, they are entering into these positive expected value strategies that rely on someone to lose money to exist. That is, if we have everyone trying to get an edge, everyone using an algorithm and trying to get, get alpha, get some sort of net value on average from their trades, there must be some group that's in the marketplace uh, that is losing money on average, okay? And, and that group is the retail investor, the mom and pop trader. And without this group present, you know, these groups can't enter either because they would just be preying upon each other. They, they can't you know, expect to make net money on average 
unless this is, there's a group of net losers. And that tends to mean that wherever the retail investors go, the other groups will, will co-locate. Okay, so this is kind of the marquee group that needs to be brought to the centralized exchange. And their main concerns are sort of user experience, which is something that DEXs struggle with and I'm not going to focus on. But they want, they want ease of use and uh, simplicity. They don't want to have to go through a KYC process. They don't want to have to understand how smart contracts work. Uh, and they also care about depth and price. They want to buy something, they want it to be available, and they don't want to think that they're getting gouged so that they could go to Binance or to Coinbase or somewhere else and obtain the same thing thereafter uh, for less. Right? And so in order to, to sort of attract this group, we need to improve upon these UX depth and price issues, and I'm going to mostly focus on how to improve prices. Uh, for, for retail investors. And the key thing here is that these issues of latency and throughput, like Starks, Snarks, you know, whatever you want to call it, you know, this is not going to drive mom and pop to suddenly pick up a DEX because they've adopted the latest scaling technology. It doesn't matter, right? They care about meeting their objective of acquiring or liquidating a token, and it tends to be something they're not going to do you know, many times a day. Okay, and then once we have these, these individuals, professional traders, regardless of how the, the architecture of the exchange works, you know, we'll locate there too in order to be able to find a way to, to earn money from the presence of this group. Any, are there any questions so far? Yeah? It's, not, it's really a zero sum game, this, because I think we have been created out of value, so it's not really. Do you think this is a zero sum game? No, it's not a zero sum game. Right, and I will describe why in a little bit. Okay, so, so the proposed rule is selective delay, which is very, very simple. It's, it's, this is one of its actual main selling points for me, as opposed to anything else we might do to modify the way exchanges work, is that this is really easy to describe and understand. It's a simple, a small tweak uh, to limit order priority, such that some things occur just as they do now. That if someone requests to create an offer to buy or sell a, an asset at a specified price, a limit order, or cancel a limit order that they've created, that request is processed by the exchange endpoint immediately. Right? So as soon as the request is made, I want to, want to buy, uh, I want to have an offer to buy 100 Ethereum for some price and die that the exchange immediately goes and processes and reports that order. Likewise, if I've created that and I want to cancel it, the exchange will act immediately to make sure that no one can, people can no longer fill the order. But here is the, where the delay is introduced is when someone actually wants to fill an order, when someone actually wants to take up one of these offers to buy and sell that the maker has created, uh, those requests to fill orders are subject to an artificially imposed delay. Uh, and so that rather than an order being filled immediately, the exchange will say, yes, you know, I heard you, you want to fill the order, hold on, and then it will wait and listen for what might be you know, 150 microseconds at the IEX equity exchange, which is a you know, major US equity exchange that uses this model or one second under the, the Xerox coordinator model, which is something we're, we're introducing. Uh, Bamboo Relay is a relayer that's currently uh, experimenting with this model. <clears throat> and after this, this delay has expired, only then will the exchange go ahead and approve the order fill request and fill the order. Uh, however, you know, it could be that during this delay period, the market maker submitted a cancellation request and said, no, I, I want to cancel this. And this cancellation request would be processed immediately and would trump um, the, the request to fill the order. Okay, so what does that do? What are the consequences of that? Well, this will mean that these kinds of zero-sum trades, right, where one party is eager to make the exchange and the other party you know, does not want to make the exchange, no longer occur. Right? So that if there's a, an attempt to execute an order that, that one party views as favorable to them and the other party no longer views as favorable, because of this delay in position, that would no longer go through. It would instead be canceled. And that will prevent uh, the execution of orders, which would impose expected losses for the market makers who create these, these orders. Okay, and the ultimate goal of this is to generate more favorable prices for liquidity for the consumers, for, for the retail investors who take these maker orders. And we'll explain you know, why we might expect that outcome in the next couple slides. Okay, so in order to understand why, you know, how we should organize the market at all, we need to have some sort of principle of what the market's supposed to do and how we measure its success or effectiveness. You know, we need to have some kind of idea of what is this market doing, what are we trying to maximize, or what is our goal. 
And so here, you know, I'm going to argue that the social benefit from an exchange comes from positive sum trades, where both parties uh, perceive to have been net beneficiaries uh, of, of the, the trade that took place, and not from sort of zero-sum trades, where I, I, I'm Alice, and I sold something, and I think I lost money, and I'm Bob, and I bought that thing from Alice, and my perceived gain is equal to Alice's perceived loss. That's sort of zero-sum. Positive sum is where both Alice and Bob you know, do not regret. They're happy that the trade took place. <clears throat> So we can understand how positive sum trades can, can take place in terms of a, a difference in the preferences or goals of the actors who arrive at the marketplace. And we can have these retail investors, and they want to, they want to buy and sell something quickly. They don't want to sit around with their you know, $10,000 and wait and you know, buy you know, $100 of OMG at, at 5 a.m. and like another $50 at 6 a.m. and another you know, 10 cents at 7 a.m. They don't want to do that. They want to be able to complete their, their desired uh, buy or sell uh, quickly uh, with just sort of a, a click of a button. Right? And maybe because, simply for convenience, it may be because they need the money right away because the, the hospital is calling and they have medical bills to pay. There could be various reasons, but for whatever reason, these retail investors want to be able to buy and sell act, assets quickly. And in exchange for that, that, that ability to do this, they're willing to pay a slight premium over the assets fair market price. You know, for in exchange for being able to get their business done, they'll pay more than the asset's actually worth. You know, they buy the asset for slightly more than it's worth. They'll sell the asset for slightly less than it's worth, and they'll be happy about it. On the other hand, we have this other group of market makers, and they have sort of the opposite preferences. Now, their business is to patiently hold assets and then sell them piecemeal. Uh, when favorable prices are available. So that you know, a retail investor seeking to buy will arrive, this market maker will have this offer, and will take everything off his hands, and then he'll, he'll wait for some other, another retail investor seeking to sell, and will slowly liquidate the asset over a period of time at good prices to these you know, future, ar future arrivals. Okay? And unlike the retail investor, the market maker is only going to buy or sell at above fair market value or above fair market value because he's seeking to make money as uh, he's sort of being paid for, the, the, for, for his patients. It's sort of like a consignment store. You want to sell something, you don't want to bother selling it yourself, so you give it to an agent who acts on your behalf and sells it, and they take a, a, a fee you know, for the service they're providing. Okay, so our, our ideal exchange is going to maximize these beneficial positive sum trades. This wants to, we want to maximize the, vol the total volume of these kinds of positive sum exchanges so that no sort of social value is left lying on the table, so that anyone you know, who might want to, uh, re any retail investor who might want to buy or sell can find a price that's attractive to them that they're willing to do so at. Okay, and that's an equivalent to, ma to minimizing two things. One is the, the, the fee that the market makers charge, right? So they, they charge this premium for the service of uh, holding on to inventories and liquidating them slowly. And the lower that premium is, the more attractive use, use of the exchange is for the retail investor. The other issue is the make-take fee, make fee levied by the exchange. So not only does the market, provide, market maker charge a spread, the exchange operator also charges a percent fee on each exchange, and both of these things are sort of deterrents to these positive sum exchanges. Any questions? Okay, so then why does selective delay help with this? Why, why do we want to... Why does adding a latency, which, which favors cancellations over other types of order message, potentially improve um, the market circumstances for these two groups? Well, market makers, in their line of business of trying to serve these retail customers, must maintain standing offers to buy and sell at a fixed price in the limit order book. And doing that entails risks. Uh, when they do this, you know, then someone else might come along who's not just seeking to sell or buy because of impatience, but instead because they want to earn, earn a profit. Earn, and this, this kind of agent is doing arbitrage. They're trying to buy uh, select at a selective time when the price that the market maker is offering to sell something is, say, below market. So the, the person buying is buying at, a, at expected profit, and the market maker is going to incur uh, an expected loss. These arbitragers use public information. So there could be a number of things. It could be news. But most often, in our context, it would likely be, say, the, the ETH US dollar tether price moved than Binance, but the ETH DAI price on Radar Relay or Uniswap hasn't moved yet. And so the, the arbitrager, if it gets in and, and he saw the price of ETH go up on Binance, if he, if he gets in quickly enough, he can buy 
on Uniswap or buy and rate a relay before these market maker offers are updated and earn a small profit. And this gain that the arbitrager realizes is at the market maker's expense. So that these are zero sum exchanges. And this, this is like sort of the interesting part is that these zero sum exchanges, like we shouldn't care about them really. Like if, you know, it's like gambling. Like if, if we have a fair game and, and Alice wins and Bob loses, you know, that's nobody's business. Um, there might be no reason for any third party to care. But here there's a negative externality because market makers, right, when they offer tight spreads, when they price very close to the expected value of the asset, they can be arbitraged very easily. That is, the, a small price change in Binance could subject them to this risk of loss. And so in order to, to mitigate these losses, market makers have to recoup them by charging higher prices on the profitable trades they make. They, Every time they lose money to the arbitrager, there must be a compensating gain they make from, from, from selling to retail investor. And so the larger these losses are, the larger the prices the retail investors have to pay to buy and sell assets. Right? So, so therefore, if we can reduce these losses, we can also reduce the losses, the, the, the prices that the retail investors pay when they buy and sell. So selective delay uh, protects market makers from arbitrage losses. And that in turn leads them to be able to be profitable at a lower spread when they sell, buy and sell to, to retail traders. We're making the exchange more attractive for that group. Right? And so that's then expected to increase the volume of positive sum exchanges um, for the, the, the venue that operates under this policy and maximizing the social benefit that can be realized. And a lot of this, this discussion is based upon um, this paper that's really interesting by Baldolf and Molnar, I don't put any other citations in here, but this is definitely one, the sole, the most deserving one, because I'm borrowing very heavily from there. Okay, there's another, there's another effect here, because we talked about two sources of, of exchange, uh, sort of trading costs for retail investors. One was the spread that the retail investor pays to the market maker, and the second was the exchange fee, the make take fee that the taker pays to the exchange, and selectively also influences this, this fee. So the equilibrium spread that a market maker will charge is not, not going to be the same across all exchanges. We see, you know, obviously that spreads in Binance and Coinbase are significantly lower than spreads in, say, Radar Relay and Uniswap. You know, why is that? Why, why if we buy or sell something, do we charge different premiums depending on where we're buying and selling? Right? It's maybe not immediately obvious that would be the case. It is because this equilibrium spread is going to depend on the relative frequency of positive sum and zero sum trades. If, if, we have, you know, if we have these arbitrage bots that are looking for the opportunity to buy something for less than it's worth, they're going to be active anywhere. It doesn't cost much additional money to sort of set up my bot to monitor Uniswap and Radar and Kyber and everywhere else at once. Right? So if there's an opportunity, the bots are going to take it wherever it's located. And so the likelihood of taking an order is going to be more or less uniform across all possible venues, which means this frequency of arbitrage is going to be the same you know, for, for a given asset pair at all exchanges. And the more frequent arbitrage is, the more losses the market makers experience, the larger premiums they need to charge to their retail customers. On the other hand, we have this retail trade, and that will differ across venues. It could be that you know, Binance offers better prices than average, so I just go to Binance. Uh, and I'm not going to be able to have the time to sort of, whenever I want to buy myself something, look at every single possible place I could go. I'll just, as a habit, go to a place that's generally reliable, provides a good UX and good prices. And so those habits that the, the, the retail consumers have will lead to some exchanges that are larger and more frequently used, consistently having more retail volume than other exchanges that may be new or just you know, may, may not have attracted as much adoption. Okay, so these exchanges that have more benefit from more frequent retail trade will be able to offer tighter equilibrium spreads uh, than the exchanges that are infrequently used. Okay, so that, the implication is the relative frequency of trade is going to vary, of, re, of these two types of trades will vary across exchanges, and the largest, most successful exchanges will, will have sort of a, a you know, a, a, a ongoing persistent benefit. They'll have a moat. Right, because the fact that they've attracted so much retail volume means that they're more attractive places to buy and sell, and you can buy and sell at lower prices, which means that the retail investors will continue to patronize them. So there's sort of this, 
this virtuous cycle for these exchanges that have been su successful in attracting customers, that they're likely to continue to be successful. Okay. Uh, and this, this actually matters when we think about these exchange fees, um, because if, if we have these market makers who are operating at larger exchanges and charging narrow spreads, that, that creates this rent that the exchanges can, can earn a piece of. The exchange, seeing that it has so many customers, that it has a lower, narrower uh, prices than any of its competitors, can begin to levy a make-take fee. And as long as it doesn't get so greedy that, that it, it no longer has an attractive user value proposition, it can sort of charge this fee, even though its competitor isn't, and still be the cheapest pr place to buy and sell. So we have this equilibrium where this dominant exchange is charging fees, and yet even inclusive of these fees has the best prices, and this small sort of nascent exchange has no fees, maybe it even has a subsidy, and its prices yet, yet are, are still worse than the dominant exchange, and that, that can persist. Okay, so selective delay will neutralize this because it results in all these arbitrage, you know, trades based on public information being shut down. We no longer have, in this case, that someone can someone can seek to, to complete an exchange that the other party to the exchange no longer wants to, to, to take place. Okay, selective delay will neutralize the scaling advantage, which encourages uh, lower spreads everywhere because you know, this factor, the factor that varied across exchanges is no longer present. <coughs> uh, or the, this, this factor that led to, sorry, variance in prices across exchanges is no longer present. And that then encourages more competition you know, because small exchanges no longer suffer this kind of systematic disadvantage versus, versus the largest players. And here, if we want to think about small, the David and Goliath, you know, the Goliath might be the centralized exchange because of their large existing volume. And the David are these startup, you know, nascent decentralized exchanges that are being, trying to sort of begin to attract volume. All right, once we've neutralized this advantage of scale, um, then the large exchange can no longer extract this fee, right, because it doesn't have this, you know, benefit uh, that allows it to sort of charge larger prices than its competitors, which means more competition in the exchange market, lower make-take fees for the retail investor, and lower trading costs overall. Okay, so now um, this is kind of, that, that gave you a broad overview of kind of what, what, what the deal is with this talk, what the idea, the core idea is. I'm going to try and uh, give an illustrative example. It will show some of the concepts, but if someone has a question, it would be a good time to, to yeah. Oh, right. Oh, um, Thank you for the presentation. Uh, just not, you're not mentioning one uh, downside of this mm -hmm. is obviously that some trades not, don't get executed. Uh, so that's obviously a downside for the retail yes. investor. So you, I'm, I'm lifting a price and uh, it's not done. Right. So that that's obviously should be included in the in the experience of the user and his habits in uh, using this exchange. No, I mean. Yes. I'm missing so, something. I mean, this is like there is a downside that maybe trades won't get executed. But if we think about it, this case, and I think this will the illustration will help a little bit. But where we have arbitrage, there's going to be this public information that you can earn money simply by take filling an order that's available to multiple parties at once. And typically, you know, for the retail investor, this opportunity to buy something at that below market price wouldn't be available anyways because it'd be like ten different bots that are all competing to try and take that opportunity and are, are faster than our, our mom and pop trader, right? So the, the trades that, in that sense, that don't get executed are ones that were you know, not ben socially beneficial anyways, uh, in most cases. Although the, I agree that it's not entirely true, but it's true to, to you know, first degree of approximation. Does that answer your question? Yeah, okay, first degree. Okay, so this is just an example. If there's any other questions, yeah. Don't you think it's one of those chicken and egg situations again? Mm -hmm. um, and that's, you know, if there were enough liquidity on those DEXs, um, surely uh, there would be plenty of arbitragers and the arbitrage opportunities would diminish. Um, so you don't think it, it, it would be better actually to uh, have more arbitragers, if anything? No. Um, so this, is, this argument is, is not going to disappear. Even if we have one single exchange, like there was just one national exchange, we could still make the same argument that people were arbitrage against news. Maybe Trump announces tariffs uh, on the, that, that are going to benefit U.S. steel producers, and once that announcement is made, people will rush to buy U.S. steel stocks. It doesn't matter you know, if there are 30 exchanges or just one single exchange. You can still make the exact same argument. Right. 
Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. Um, so let's see how much time, I, time time do I have? Yeah, I should probably. I'm just going to. I'm going to sort of skip through some of this because it isn't um, necessary. So, so the basic idea is that we typically will have a stable, you know, bid ask quote. So this is the ask, and this is the bid. And typically, you know, a retail investor will arrive and will take one of these offers to buy or sell. Um, but the retail investors won't order won't have a price impact. Right? They'll just buy, and the market will maybe temporarily there may be some small blip uh, in price adjustment. But then the, the market will recover to the same equilibrium price it did before, uh, and that will be sort of how the market works 99% of the time. And then 1% of the time, you'll have a price movement um, where the taker will sort of, the price will move in some other venue or there'll be some news announced. And then a chunk of this liquidity will be removed by arbitragers and the price won't recover. The arbitrager will earn a profit. The market maker will take a loss. And so, okay. So how does, how does this traditional system work where we prioritize all messages equally? So under this traditional mechanic, all of the messages that the exchange receives are processed uh, on a first in, first out basis of order or of arrival. So if in the, someone wants to take an order and that message that I want to take this r r arrives first, but before the message I want to cancel that order, then the order gets taken. So if we have a bunch of incoming messages, you know, say that someone in SF, they want to, the market maker's located in San Francisco where I'm from, they wanted to cancel this order and they said so from SF and the exchange is located in London. And then, you know, a microsecond later, a trader in London says I want to fill that order. Well, the exchange is just going to approve whichever message it receives first. In this case, with just a microsecond gap between these two things originated, originating, even though this guy acted first, the exchange heard about this message first, and so this trader will get the fill. Um, we could have another trader in, in NYC who's also trying to arbitrage the order, and maybe he acted before the trader in London too, but he can still fail um, because his message was not as quick the endpoint as the, the trader who's co-located with the exchange. Okay, so then the exchange will hear about this message first, and then this message, and then this message, and the result would be that the fill request from trader A is approved, uh, trader B is too late, late, it's already been filled, and the maker is much too late. You know, it, it would have gotten filled twice over by the time he, he, got it, he tried to cancel. And then this arbitrage prize, this sort of zero-sum gain, is gonna be awarded to trader A, and some sort of pros and cons of this are immediacy. So you brought up that we have these, these transactions that are one cost of selective delay with some transactions that would no longer be filled. Well, in this system, we can immediately finalize a transaction in less than one millisecond, so very, very quickly, uh, which is very positive. Also, it's very familiar. So this is a dominant exchange process in equities trading. So everyone is sort of accepting this as the natural order of, of trading. Uh, and that is a very powerful advantage versus some other system that might be unfamiliar and new. Uh, disadvantages in the decentralized context, you know, time is relative. So we saw that the fact that exchange endpoint was located in London mattered. And that means that we need to, because time is relative, people might perceive it differently. We need a single trusted authority who's controlling this transaction ordering. And this is typically not auditable. Like we're dealing with gaps in time of microseconds. There's no way an external third party can verify that events actually transpired as the exchange reports. So exchanges have this ample ability um, to abuse this trust by you know, giving, for example, the profitable fill to their friends or to the exchange's own proprietary arbitrage bot, whatever trader fears is that the exchange might be trading against them, utilizing the fact that it, can, it, it has this god mode where it says which orders came first and which orders and, uh, came second, which is the same as last. Uh, another disadvantage is that in terms of this desire to create a decentralized ecosystem is this system inherently creates a market pressure to concentrate all trading activity at a single exchange. And the only kind of limiting factor to this is that the single exchange will get greedy and begin to charge fees. And those, those fees, those margins it's collecting, create an uh, opening for competitors to also operate, but with, with slightly lower, well, demanding slightly lower amounts. Another disadvantage is that because of these fees, that the large exchanges will levy, and because of the arbitrage costs that the market maker needs to amortize, there'll be a high come fee bid ask spread that the retail traders must pay when they buy and sell assets. Another disadvantage in terms of thinking about Ethereum as a global blockchain, which wants to, you know, they want to level this kind of geographic lottery, make everyone equal in their access to financial markets. Well, that simply can't happen if we have a system where 
your geographic distance from and this, this sort of authority about time is going to determine you know, how readily you can access orders. Right? So, so there's these kinds of conflicts between the traditional model and the, the goals and values that, that sort of the blockchain, the DeFi space is setting out to achieve. And they, can't, they cannot be rectified by you know, improving latency and throughput. Like regardless of how fast things might get, it's still a winner-take-all race, and whoever is first wins everything, and whoever is second is the same as the person who is last. And that kind of dynamic means that you, know, you might improve you know, the winning that might be decided by a microsecond, a nanosecond, a millisecond, or a second, but the outcome is always the same regardless. Okay. Um, we can think about the, the way that the blockchain operates. It doesn't utilize, um, actually, a first-in, first-out basis. You know, Uniswap... Uh, Ether, Ether Delta or Oasis Dex or Xerox, they're not actually using that system. They have a, a permissionless system where instead the order of message arrival is determined by a miner. Right? So it might be that you know, this, this, actually, this message from London came first to the miner. He heard about this transaction first, but he only attached a 70 cent fee. And before a block arrived, you know, this trader in New York City was going to bid this up to $2. And the cancel request from the, make, so the market maker in SF also arrived, but only with a $1 fee. And the, the, the miner will simply order these based on whoever paid him the most and award the profitable fill to trader B, denying the cancel requests and fill requests of the other two traders. Right? So in this case, instead of being an arbitrage trade being awarded to whoever is fast sits, it's awarded to whoever pays the highest mining fee. Right? So trader B comes first, it's supposed to be you know, trader A second, the maker is last. So this system also has, you know, its disadvantages. Right? It's decentralized in some sense because at least there are many different miners, in theory, who are ordering transactions. Um, so it's not just one dominant party controlling everything. Um, it is relatively transparent, and as long as miners follow the rules, we can see, you know, there's the largest bribe, which the largest gas price should should be awarded the fill. Um, geographic proximity doesn't matter so much because if with a 15 second block interval everyone has time more or less to get their bribe to the miner and so whoever pays the most wins um, but you know it has this is not, not no, by no means ideal so the miners are extracting significant revenue from this ability to auction off transaction priority rights and so, so when, a, when a retail investor buys OMG on a centralized exchange part of the money they're going is to pay this miner this rent he gets, right? So they, the, the inv retail investors have to somehow absorb this cost of giving the miners their, their take. Um, there's, it's even more expensive than the traditional model because we now have fees and risks, uh, new kinds of fees and risks for cancellation. So in many cases, you know, cancellations need to be on chain. So not only do you need to cancel, and not only do you, do you is it possible that you cancel but it failed to succeed? It's also possible that you try to cancel and you pay a fee to try cancel, but you don't even achieve your aim. And you, the money is just sort of more money for the miner. Uh, and so we can think of that as kind of like a worst case, where we have even worse um, bid-ask spreads than we do on the traditional exchange model. And the selective delay model, uh, all right, so that was wrong, wrong order. So we can just think of this, this um, wiggly line indicating an art artificial delay imposed upon request to take, and the green line meaning that the order is sort of prioritized and gets get the, the listening endpoint treats it as arriving first. And in this case, this arbitrage prize is denied because by, when the price movement happens, there's this artificial time period that's, uh, awarded, that's afforded to the the market maker, which gives him the opportunity to cancel. So he, he will, in general, always win these races. So the race conditions are just resolved by saying cancel, cancel or wins whenever there's a race. And takers always lose. Okay, so then this stale limit order is canceled. And the advantage is, the key advantage, as we've seen, is this low, the ability to realize a lower a comfy bid ask spread. And that comes both from the lower premiums that market makers charge and also from the reduced market power that exchanges have. Uh, another key advantage is familiarity. Is it's not the dominant model, but except for this one small difference, it's exactly the same. So it's very intuitive to understand how this might work compared to some other sort of what I would perceive as more complex trading systems that might accomplish something similar. Uh, it, it nullifies this geogra geographic or latency advantage for the most part because because of this waiting period, the fact that I'm in Johannesburg and you're in London doesn't matter at all because we've all had 
sufficient time to get our message, our cancel messages across. Uh, it leads to greater decentralization and competition among exchanges uh, because there's no longer this, this, in, this inherent tendency for liquidity, a large pool of liquidity to get more liquidity because uh, a widely used exchange uh, means a greater relative frequency of retail trade, which means lower prices offered by market makers, which means a greater frequency of re retail trade. We no longer have that, that sort of virtuous cycle that leads the big exchanges to get bigger and the small exchanges to fail. Um, some disadvantages, there's still this need for an authority. We still need someone to order stuff, um, but it's with greatly reduced trust requirements. Like if I, if I receive an order fill, I can sort of broadcast an encrypted announcement. Like I received this message that I'll reveal later. And then you can then audit whether I actually waited, say, a second um, before approving the fill or not. Um, if everyone has, if, you know, as soon as I get it, I broadcast that something was received, I can then prove you know, what I received first. To, you know, as long as this latency is, you know, say, a second or two seconds. So if it's sufficiently long, we can prove to participants whether the exchange is actually ordering things honestly or not. Uh, disadvantage is reduced immediacy, so that right, we, we can't actually finalize things in milliseconds. We need to wait a second. From my perspective, this probably does not matter uh, for the vast majority of retail traders. It matters a lot to the people who are doing algo trading, HFTs, people who are trying to be intermediaries in this process of of linking the, the retail liquidity demander to the liquidity provider, people who are trying to get in the middle and earn some, some rent from that process, they need speed. Um, but for the actual retail investor, I feel that this immediacy is not typically very important. A, and a major downside is that it can impair price discovery. If we have a, a situation where the market gets very, very chaotic, and so everyone has canceled their orders, um, that can continue. You know. In, because people don't want to be the first guy to sort of actually commit to a price, right? So we can get in the situation that if all exchanges were using this model uh, and we had an episode of market volatility, it might take longer for the market to actually discover a price, which could be sort of socially disadvantageous, right? So there's this potential downside that might, uh, might mean that this isn't something, a model that should be universally applied in all circumstances, but it is very, very fitting to the case of centralized exchanges. There are these kind of David players um, that are not, you know, where prices actually discovered. You know, for the foreseeable futures, prices are discovered in Binance and Coinbase. Uh, and so it doesn't actually matter if this function is impaired in centralized exchanges. They just want to be able to be attractive enough to users to begin to get market traction. And this is a really, you know, appealing strategy for doing that in that situation, even though if it might not be something that exists forever. Okay, and so that's going to wrap it up. I'm just going to finally mention, though, that this isn't the only you know, game in the universe. You know, there's other uh, possible ways of addressing arbitrage. There's other proposed market designs that could be used to try and deal with this inefficiency. So selective delay is the one I discussed. I think discrete batch auctions is probably something... How many of you have heard of discrete batch auctions? Okay, so, if, so a few, maybe 25%, uh, right? This is probably a more popular alternative that accomplishes much of the same thing. In many senses, this is very, very similar. Um, I would argue that selective delay is a closer, it stays closer to the existing status quo practices, which makes it more likely, in my opinion, to be something that gains traction. If you can sort of keep all the rules the same so people still feel like they're doing exactly what they were before, um, that might be something easier to get users to accept than, than what I would see as a more substantial departure from the status quo. Another even more exotic and complex variant is fully continuous trading. And this variant, like, uh, say you were using Uniswap and you wanted to buy, uh, you, you, they have ETH in their liquidity pool and you want to buy that ETH using your DAI. And this variant, you can't actually do that in a one-off transaction. Instead, you need to say, I'm going to use my 1,000 100, DAI to buy and I'm going to divide that buy over the next hour evenly. Right? So in this case, you, can't, you can only finalize trades over an extended period and this also can uh, largely eliminate this inefficiency, but it's even harder for people to sort of potentially wrap their heads around. So I think this is actually something that's very important for thinking about you know, what the ideal exchange might look like. It's not just what solves the sort of economic problem, but it's also sort of what solves the economic problem in a way that the ordinary user can understand, where they're not actually required to learn anything new, and the problem still gets solved for them. And in this case, you know, I think this is a really elegant way of solving the problem, but it, it definitely requires people to learn a whole lot that's new. This is another way of solving the problem. Uh, and 
they think it requires users, new users to learn the minimum amount. Like they can just, they, they don't even need to know it's happening and they can still utilize the exchange. Okay, so that's all. Um, I'm probably over time, but if anyone wants to ask me questions, they can do out so afterwards or if there's another moment now, they can do it now. Where's the mic? Sorry. Um, it seems like maybe there's another potential problem with this, uh, which is also that it would seem, seem to make uh, like phantom quotes more likely, where mm -hmm. uh, if trading is quite fragmented and you can see 10, 10 quotes across 10 different venues, uh, and it turns out that only one of them is actually fillable at once, because if you fill one, all, the other nine will disappear because it's uh, the selective delay means that there's no way that you can take all of them at the same time. Do you think that's a problem, or is this not really actually an issue? Um, so I think it can be an issue, um, but you have to imagine, like, we only want to cancel in the case that the news actually means this trade is no longer profitable. And so it's just simply someone taking an order, uh, you know, a small, uh, relatively modest sized order on one decentralized exchange is unlikely to provoke any kind of reaction or revaluation. It's more of like on, on Binance, some whale occurred and they, you know, appeared and they, they bought $500,000 worth. And that actually causes a sustained, a relatively sustained deviation from the current price. That will provoke a cancellation. And this is something that, that you know, it occurs, a large number percentage of trades occur around these events. Um, but they only happen relatively rarely. So 99% of sort of the time, you know, the price is stable, and then 1% of the time, there's, there's an event that causes a significant movement. So you would see like cancellation and order failures around these relatively rare events, but the other 99% of the time, you would likely see orders being processed as normal. And the idea is that the, the actual mom and pops you know, who want to buy OMG for whatever reason, and they arrive at the exchange randomly, so 99% of the time they're just going to, you know, it's just going to be business as usual and their orders will be filled. And then 1% of the time they'll be unlucky and they'll happen to submit a buy or sell request that happens to coincide with a, a market event that changes prices and the order will fail. But it doesn't really matter for them because their orders are, are randomly evenly distributed over time as opposed to concentrated uh, at market news events, right? So the orders that fail are these sort of arbitrage, HFT, algo trader, trader orders, and not the positive sum exchanges between the retail investor and the liquidity provider. Um, another question. Have you thought about market manipulation uh, potential with this? Because mm -hmm. obviously since an order can be withdrawn, you can literally create fake bids or fake offers and push markets one way or another. And that, that can increase the manipulation. Yeah, there's, there's certainly some, some that, there's certainly an issue potentially of uh, you know, order spoofing where someone might create a bunch of appearance of lots of liquidity or intents uh, make orders that indicate an intent to buy. There's some ways of, of, you know, maybe not entirely eliminating but mitigating that. Like for example, you could have the exchange not actually notify the, the order creator that there had been an intent to fill those orders. It could simply say, it could just broadcast an encrypted message that the content of which is unknown at the time it's broadcast. And the market maker then you know, doesn't know, am, are these orders going to get filled or not? Um, because they're not notified that the fill request actually happened. And they only learn after the fact whether the orders have been filled. And in that case, they, they, in order to do this, they need to like, they, can't, they can only safely you leave the orders up for say half a second. And we can think you know, a bunch of liquidity that appears for half a second is probably not real liquidity. Because right, you cannot safely kind of leave the order standing uh, for more than delay length without facing this risk that it will actually be filled and there'll be nothing you can do about it. Right, so there, you can definitely something that needs to be designed around and taken taking into consideration. But from my perspective, it's not as critical of an issue, particularly like in the situation that decentralized exchanges are. Like if you want to manipulate the price of ETH, you do so on Binance. You wouldn't think you can sort of wag, you know, the dog can wag the tail. You, know, right, you, can, you, can, you don't know what I'm saying. Manipulating on Uniswap or Radar probably is not going to do, do much, right? So, so but and this is getting back to this idea that, that price discovery can be an issue. Like, if we have every single exchange, including the largest players using this model, there are, are definitely issues with price discovery and attempts to manipulate price discovery that arise. If just some small decentralized exchanges that are maybe less than 1% of market volume adopt it, that, that kind of concern doesn't seem so important. All right.